what we've got is the 0.1 molar. It was in 0.1 molar calcium nitrate, right? That's a common ion. So initially, instead of having zero, we have 0.1 of this stuff already. 0.1 of this. We already have 0.1 in the flask. Of course, we don't have any hydroxide. I think it was calcium nitrate or something that was given this 0.1. Oh, yeah, there it is, calcium nitrate. It was given in a 0.1 concentration. So we already have something in there. If the question is, will more dissolve or less dissolve, the answer is less, right? Because you already have something in there. Then we go to the change. Because we have that zero, you know it's going to have to lose some from the left going to the right. One here, therefore, it's a plus S. Two here, therefore, it's a plus 2S. Okay? Now we do the chemistry for equilibrium. As before, we take what was available initially minus the change or plus the change in this case, and this is what we get. The calcium ion concentration is going to be 0.1 plus S, and then the hydroxide concentration is 2S, 2S. We plug those values into the KSP equation. That's all there is to it. So let's do that. But to make our math a little simpler, then this to the minus 6, and this is 0.1, we could neglect the S for now, do a quick calculation, and then check the assumption. So once again, we're assuming that plus S here is so small that essentially the value is 0.1. And the reason I can assume that is because this is to the minus 6. This is a very, very small amount. So if we do that, then essentially this is what we've got, right? 0.1 and 2S. S is the unknown. We got rid of the plus S, so we got S as the unknown. Once again, your algebra skills, this is squared, so that's going to be 4s squared, right? Times 0.1, so the 4 becomes 0.4. Divide both sides by 0.4 and take the square root, and you get an answer. The answer is 4 times 10 to the minus 3. That is what the solubility is. 4 times 10 to the minus 3. Now let's make sure we've got it right. Check the assumption, 4.3 times 100. So it's a 4% error. Remember, five, less than 5%, we're okay. This is 4%. I don't have to do no more fancy algebra, quadratic, any of that kind of stuff. So that's all there is to it. If you got something in there, it's going to dissolve a lot less than if you didn't have anything in there. And you have to account for that stuff that you started. So initially, you don't have zero anymore, right? You have something in there. So when you do your equilibrium, you have to add that extra to that equilibrium. Now let's predict the formation. Is it going to form or not? In this classic example, this is what I've got. I've got two beakers of stuff that will precipitate. So I've got a beaker here and a beaker here of different stuff. And then I'm going to combine them into one beaker. Will a precipitate form or not? Will a precipitate form or not? It's usually what happens. So individually, uh, if you remember what chapter was that last semester for that about precipitation, if the things will precipitate or not, if I can have them in separate beakers and they look like water, but when I mix them together and if they combine to form a solid, they will precipitate. But I'm adding this semester for chemistry two that it has to exceed its KSP in order for it to precipitate. If it does not ex exceed the KSP, it will not precipitate. So we got to calculate where is it on the KSP. So if QSP, the calculated value, is equal to the KSP, no precipitation. If QSP is less than the KSP, no precipitation. If QSP is greater than KSP, precipitation. It's going to form a solid. So those are the rules. Let's calculate. For saturated solution of a slightly soluble ionic salt, QSP is equal to KSP. Okay? When two solutions containing the ions of slightly soluble salts are mixed, so that's what two beakers I said. If QSP is equal to KSP, the solution is saturated and no change will occur. 
you won't see. It still looks like water. Even though I mix things that can precipitate, it's going to look like water. Okay. On the other hand, if the QSP is greater, a precipitate will form. The remaining solution is saturated. So what happens now? Instead of looking like water, you'll see the solid, and if you let it long enough, you'll see the material in the bottom of the beaker, right? Due to gravity, it'll precipitate down to the bottom of the beaker, and you'll see that it is a precipitate now. Uh, and if it doesn't exist, if QSP is less than, no precipitate will form because the solution is unsaturated. Very important slide. I cannot overemphasize. You need to learn these greater than, less than, equal to, and what does it mean? What does it mean? Turn to you. Test question. Will it precipitate? The only time it'll precipitate is when the QSP is greater than the KSP, right? If it's equal to or less than, it looks like water. If you put that last tablespoon of sugar in that iced tea, oh, it's sweet tea now. Maybe it's salty. Okay, so very important slide right here. That's all two weeks of this semester. It's three answers, right? Three answers are possible for precipitation, for solubility. Okay, okay. You're not falling asleep on me, are you? All right. Effects of pH on solubility. Sure enough, if you can dissolve it, and pH is usually, we're probably looking at pH more of the acid side, you know, because acid will dissolve stuff. So if you put acid in there, it'll dissolve more than if there is no acid in there. Change in pH affects the solubility of many slightly soluble ionic compounds. Absolutely, all those rocks out here. I mean, Geologists, the addition of the hydronium ion will increase the solubility of a salt that contains the anions of a weak acid. So if it's an anion of a weak acid, it's going to react and pull that anion out. And if it pulls the anion out, that means more has to be made. So it's going to shift to the right. So you get more solubility. Got this classic right here, calcium carbonate, calcium going to the carbonate. So if I add acid, it's going to react with the CO3. That's the weak anion. And when it reacts to the weak NO3, it's going to give me this. But the important part is it now pulled this out, right, to give me this. Therefore, more of it has to come that way. And then this one's a neat one because it pulls out even more. Because essentially what the product you get, because there's more acid in there, it's going to get this, and you're going to get the... CO2 gas. And if you know CO2 gas, it being a gas, it, it goes away, right? This is where you see these solutions that it begins to bubble. You begin to get those CO2 bubbles out and it's dissolving. Like if I put something um, like calcium carbonate, for example, there. If I put a, a rock of calcium carbonate in water, nothing really happens. If I put a, a rock of calcium carbonate in uh, acetic water, then it'll begin to dissolve based on this reaction right here. And you certainly will see the bubbles of the CO2 coming out. And here it is right here. That's what they did. You got some calcium carbonate, you put it in here. And if the pH is less than seven, you see the bubbles escaping out in the CO2. And therefore, more of this is dissolved, right? More of it's dissolved because it's leaving a CO2. And as it leaves, more of it will be made, more of it will be made till we dissolve it all. Oops. Predicting the effects of solubility by adding strong acid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's see what they do. So write a balanced chemical equation to explain whether the addition of H3O plus form is a strong acid affects the solubility of each of the compounds. Ah, we're gonna have to decide whether it's a weak anion or a strong anion. Remember, if it's a weak anion, it will react with the acid. It will pull it away. If it's a strong, it will not. Okay, so for example, bromide, bromide comes from HBr. HBr is a strong. So we got to write the balanced chemical equations. Here we are. So this is what we got. We got the lead bromide. Bromide from a strong acid or a weak acid. 
Bromide is the anion of a strong acid, so it does not react with H3O plus. The addition of a strong acid has no effect. So Br is out of HBr, as you see right there. If you look at the Ka value for it, or have that memorized that Br is a very uh, electronegative, so it really pulls the electrons and releases the hydrogen easy. Therefore, it's a strong acid, and it'll have no effect. It can't dissolve any more uh, lead bromide in a solution of less than 7 pH. No effect at all. Now, the other one, calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is, sounds like a tricky one, but where does the hydroxide come? Hydroxide comes from water, and water is actually a weak. So let's see what the answer is. Again. We got this, oh, it's copper hydroxide. We got this copper hydroxide solution here. We got the hydroxide. Is it strong or is it weak? I think it's a little on the weak side because normally hydroxide and water comes from the H2O dissolving also. Okay, OH is an anion of water, is a very weak acid, and is in fact a strong base, right? We know that. It's a weak acid and it's in fact a strong acid and strong base. It will react with the H3O. Sure enough, it's H3O and OH plus OH minus is going to react to form more water. So it's pulling it out. The OH is, is going away to form H2O. Therefore, this solution is going to be even more soluble, or it's going to go to the uh, to the right. This reaction will go to the right. So we've got this, the hydroxide, the hydronium reacting to form water. Addition of a strong acid will cause an increase in solubility. An increase in solubility means that it goes more to the right. Hey, okay, now we got this. Hmm. Strong or weak? This is what we got to look at. Strong or weak? I think this is a weak, right? H2S, H2S, HS is a weak, so if it's a weak, it's gonna pull it. The anion of a weak acid, it's gonna pull it. So S is the anion of HS minus, a weak acid, and it's a strong base. It will react completely with water to form HS and OH minus. Both of these ions will react with the added H3O plus. Sure enough, it's gonna pull it out of there. So therefore, it's gonna go to the right again, or the solubility will increase. Here's the chemistry that goes with it, so the HS, H3O, go and give me water. So the addition of a strong acid will cause an increase in solubility. So if you can remember, and you don't have to remember, if you look up the Ka values, you know if it's a strong acid or a weak acid. Questions, concerns? A lot of information, no? Not enough information? Well, let's look at just something practical. Have you ever wondered why they form the stalactites and the stalagmites? Anybody ever been to the cavern? Carlsbad, New Mexico. What's the one there? What's it called? Natural heat. Yeah. And it's chemistry that forms it, especially the CO2. I'm sorry, the carbonated water and the, uh, the water has CO2 and the CO2 comes down and dissolves the calcium carbonate, just like we showed you before, right? There's the calcium carbonate. That's what it's made out of. Those rocks are made out of calcium carbonate. You take the CO2 and H2 and you get the calcium and the hydroxide. And as it dissolves it, I guess it got those formations. And also on the bottom, as it accumulates and, and the CO2 disappears, then it'll form in, on the bottom too. But it really is a, a chemistry thing. Those K's are formed because of the, of the uh, water being carbonated, the groundwater being carbonated. It acts as an acid and dissolves those rocks. Of course, it takes quite a few years, right? Okay, now let's go to predict. So the last thing I got for you guys. Oh, man, I missed out earlier. Let's predict, will it precipitate or will it not precipitate? We have my two days. Will it 
form of solid material or will it still look like a clear liquid? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to mix two beakers together. Okay. So here it is. Method of pre uh, preparing a precipitate is to mix solutions containing the compound. So what's important to us is does the precipitate form when 0.1 liters of calcium nitrate is mixed with 0.2 liter, uh, 0.2 liters of 0 0.06 molar sodium fluoride. Cool. So where is the precipitate? The sodium doesn't precipitate, so the precipitate will be calcium fluoride, right? I'm remembering my chemistry from last year or from last semester. The precipitate form will be the calcium and the fluoride forming because sodium and nitrate don't form precipitates. It's that rule. Anything in the 1A uh, group of the periodic table will not precipitate out. So sodium is certainly 1A. Okay. So I've got the concentrations. So therefore, I need to calculate the concentrations in of uh, the calcium and the concentration of the fluoride. So first, we need to decide slightly soluble salt. So we got a KSP. Ooh, do we have a KSP? We'll look it up. Solution. Okay. Like I said, in that beaker, in those beakers, this is what I would have, calcium nitrate and the sodium fluoride, right? Sodium and nitrate salts are soluble, so they don't precipitate. So the precipitation will be this. <clears throat> Essentially what I've got is I've got a beaker here with the calcium two plus ions, right? And what was my nitrate? Nitrate NO3 minus. plus a beaker of the sodium, so the Na in the beaker. And what was that with the Na, uh, F, F minus in the Na, right? And when I mix them into one big beaker, what do I have? I have something that can precipitate out which is gonna be the calcium fluoride. And that's gonna be, another symbol for precipitation is the arrow down, it falls down from solution, right? And then in the beaker, I'm gonna have the Na plus running around and the NO3 running around as ions. That's the chemistry behind it. So if you remember the terminology, these are spectator ions. They're only there to balance that. And this is a precipitation reaction. That's what it was last semester. I just told you. Now this semester, I want to know if it really forms a precipitate. It can only form a precipitate if it exceeds the KSP. If it exceeds the KSP concentration, it will form. If not, it will not form a precipitate. But still spectator ions, solubility, all that kind of stuff. So I figured out that calcium fluoride can combine. I went to the data table. The KSP of that is 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11. So what do I have to do? I have to figure out the concentrations of the chloride and the concentration of the fluoride. And if those concentrations are less than 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11, it will not precipitate or equal, I should say, less than two or equal to 3.2 times 10 to minus 11, no precipitation. If those concentrations, when I calculate them together, are going to be greater than 3.2 to the minus 11, then a precipitate is formed. So here we go. The solubility of calcium fluoride is gonna be the calcium ion and two fluoride ions raised to the power of the coefficients. So it's a concentration of the, chlor of the calcium times the fluoride squared. So let's figure out the concentrations of each, which is easy because that data has been given to us. Now we're gonna have to do a little math here. So I know how many moles. If I know how many liters, I know how many moles. If I know how many liters, I know how many moles because I know the molarity. And then of course now they're all in the same beaker. So you're gonna have to sum up the volume of 0.1 liter and the volume of 0.2 liter to figure out the concentration of each one. 
And the only ones I really care is the calcium and the fluoride. I don't really care the concentration of the sodium or the nitrate. So the solution is this. You need to calculate calcium and fluoride in the final solution. The final solution now, they're mixed in one beaker, right? I had a beaker of 0.1 liter and a beaker of 0.2 liters. Now I combine them into a beaker of 0.3 liters. So that's my total volume, and they're both in the same beaker, so they both experience the 0.3 liter volume. All right, so simply calculate the moles. We always do mole things here in chemistry. So the moles is going to be 0.1 times 0.03 or 0.03 moles. And the concentration of the calcium, here I divided by the total volume, right? The 0.1 and the 0.2. So now that's what I need. I need the concentration of the calcium. And the next thing I need is the concentration of the fluoride. So again, the fluoride is 0 0.06, 0 0.2, so 0 0.12. And now I divide by the same 0.3 liters and I got the concentration of the fluoride. Now, I just need a calculator and I need to plug these answers in to my KSP equation, which is a concentration of the, of the calcium times the concentration of the fluoride squared and see what the answer is. The answer is 1.6 times 10 to the minus four. Will it precipitate or not? Will it precipitate or not? Yes or no? In this particular case, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4 is much greater than 3.2 to the minus 11. Remember, it's much bigger, so the answer is yes. If I put these and I mix them up together, I'll see a bunch of solid materials along the bottom. Form. No longer look like water. That's that's the answer. If it's greater than yes. If it's equal to or less no. Equal to or less the answer is no. Are you ready for tomorrow? Who's not ready for tomorrow? Anybody done chapter 19 homework? Are these the kind of problems you're looking for 19? 18 and 19. You want to ask me again what the exam's going to be on? It's going to be chapter 18 and 19. You should have the study guide already. So that's what the material is going to be and what we've covered here in class. And if you do 18, 19 homework, it should be the same. And by the way, if you learn chapter 17, this is pretty easy. It's the same thing as chapter 17. Uh, just a few more concepts of the same thing that you're getting through. The exam is going to be from 10 to 11, right? I think the first exam, pretty much all of you took care of that time thing. Because it won't grade it if you go past 11 and submit it. Or you have to submit it too, right? You have to submit the exam. So don't forget to submit. Uh, I will go later this afternoon and create the exam and have it posted for you by 10 o'clock certainly tomorrow morning and 11. Uh, concerns are always good internet connection, right? Make sure you get a, a good internet connection, come to campus, don't lose it, because if you lose it, it won't let you back in. Now, I've had several of you that, that kind of lost it, and if you do it early enough, you can email me. I try to keep monitoring the exam to make sure everything's going fine, and maybe I can let you back in. Obviously, if you're already at 11 o'clock and you're, you're not, you know, if you email me, well, I'll tell you the time's over, right? And sometimes what happens is because you have the choice of when you start, look, you have an hour to do it. If you start from 10 o'clock, you have an hour to do it. If you start from 1030, some of you actually do start from 1030, then you have 30 minutes to do it, right? Okay, then you have 30 minutes to do it. I'm not going to extend. I'm sorry, you started at 1030. That was your choice, right? So if you start late, it's, it's from 10 to 11, no matter what time you start, it'll end at 11. So 
So I strongly recommend it. I, I'm preaching to the good folks. I think for the most part, pretty much of you are like ready to go, right? As soon as 10 o'clock comes, I see quite a few already, but there's always some stragglers, you know. I think last time there was eight, and then finally four showed up at the towards the very end. But at that point, you know, it's it, welcome to the real world. It stops at 11, so you can you can take the exam at 10:45, and you got 15 minutes. Good luck to you. But I will stop it at 11. Actually, I don't I don't control it anymore. Once I punch it in the computer, it stops it at 11. Okay. No questions. So this is all I've got for you for the exam. So you lucky folks that came to class. Come out early. Unless you have some questions, I'd be glad to answer. Try to respond to the email that you sent in. I'll try to deal with it on Thursday. Does that get things answered? Do you do it? I think I answered the question. Okay. So I think I answered. See you Monday. I'll be looking for you on the exam tomorrow. <laughs>